Open House, an excerpt, pages 22 through 27 of the original screenplay written by Sean J.S. Jordan and John Ingle. Interior, upstairs, master bedroom, bathroom, night. Gina, now in a bathrobe, walks down the hallway and into interior, Boyd's room, continuous, and gently pushes the door open. The hallway light pours into the room. Boyd is sitting up in bed. He looks at his mother and frantically taps his palm with his finger. Shoot. Sorry. I, I forgot. She steps quickly back into the hallway, partially closes the door behind her. Boyd sits in his bed. He hears Gina's steps fade away. She heads down the stairs. His breath quickens. Interior living room continuous. Gina passes through the living room. The tablet is not where she left it. She continues into the interior office, continuous, where she spots the tablet charging on Derek's desk. As she unplugs the device, she notices a box of framed family photos. She sets the tablet aside and flips through them. A younger Gina and Derek, both mid-twenties, at a costume party. Gina is attired as a Freudian slip, fake beard, pipe, slip, and a blazer with elbow patches. Next to her, a laughing Derek has a large ruffled piece of yellow construction paper, a potato chip on his shoulder. Gina smiles to herself. Exterior Parker home, night. The hooded figure emerges from the forest, enters the yard, and approaches the house. Motion detector security lights kick on as the figure hurries through the yard, illuminated by the lights. Interior office, night. Gina pulls out another framed photo. It's a school photo of a younger boy, five. Arms crossed, frowning, clearly pissed. The odd triangle cut out of his bangs probably has something to do with it. Interior Parker home, basement stairs, night. Lydia comes up the stairs and walks through the interior kitchen, continuous. She grabs a couple of beers from the fridge. Internet's out. Lydia turns, completely tired. Derek walks into the kitchen. She cradles the beers in one arm to check her phone. No signal bars there either. Great. Derek nods toward the beers Lydia holds. She hands him one. Thanks. Derek cracks it open and takes a long swig from the can. She just holds her beer, unopened. They stand there for an awkward moment, silent. Is there something more between them? Maybe. Night. Good night. Derek turns to walk into the dining room. Lydia waits till he's gone to reach into to the fridge for another beer. Interior office, night. Gina pulls up a photo. It's just glimpsed, not fully revealed. She stares at it for a long moment. I'm sorry. Gina looks up to see her husband. He stands in the doorway. I thought I'd gotten rid of it. Gina stands up and sets the photo back on the desk and holds up the tablet. You won't go to sleep without it. Derek sighs, moves into the room to stand in the shadows away from the desk. Maybe it's time to wean him off that thing. Gina is lost in thought. Maybe. She steps away from the desk and the photo is revealed. It's a family photo taken about five years ago. In the picture, Gina is visibly pregnant. It rests on a document that reads, Settlement Agreement. Gina pauses as if she wants to say something, but doesn't. Derek takes a sip from his beer. Must have missed it. Gina walks around the desk, away from where Derek is standing, heads for the door with her back to him. Night. Derek takes another slug from his beer as he watches her exit. Night. Entering his office, he takes the photo from on top of the settlement agreement and tosses it into the trash can. I'll be up in a minute. Derek takes another sip. A portion of the settlement agreement is revealed. Quote, stipulations regarding the resignation of Warden Derek J. Parker, unquote. 
Interior stairway, upstairs hallway, moments later. Tablet in hand, Gina walks toward Boyd's bedroom. She notices something on the floor, squats down with a little effort, and picks up a matchbox car. Match cut to interior living room. Flashback, day. Boyd, on all fours, pushes the matchbox, matchbox car around. Gina sits on the floor next to Boyd. She snaps the late last piece of track together. Her belly is slightly swollen, similar in size to how she looked in the family photo observed earlier. All right, ready to give this thing a go? Sure. Oh, I, I said I don't help. know what happened. Let me help. Here. She's, there you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> she points to the trigger. Boyd presses it. With matchbox car, launch it, launches forward into a loop with a whir, then onto a ramp where it flies into the air. It lands on another ramp and slides across the floor past a worn and well-loved stuffed fox. An excited Boyd hurries to retrieve the car. He turns to his mother. Did you see that? It stuck the landing. It did stick the landing. High five. High five. Their hands connect. Boyd sits next to his mother and loads the car. All concentration. He sets the car back into place and again struggles with the launch mechanism. Gina moves to help but pauses. She winces. In pain, she touches her side. With some effort, Boyd clicks back the launch mechanism. His face lights up with surprise. Look, I did it. Proud, he looks up at his mother. Good job, boy. She gives him a quick congratulatory pat on the shoulder. I'll be right back. Gina picks herself up off the floor and stands. Mm. Mama has to go potty. She winces and grabs her lower back. Gina buckles from the pain. Boyd glances up at his mother as she makes her way to the interior first floor, bathroom, flashback, continuous. At the toilet, Gina pulls down her yoga pants and takes a seat. She looks down to see red spots, underwear. A pink mucus-like substance is also visible. She furrows her brow, confused. Suddenly, Gina's struck by a heavy cramp. Her hands go to the sides of her belly. She doubles over, grunts through the pain. She looks down to see that the toilet water is blood red. Interior living room, flashback, continuous. Boyd is seated on the floor. Boyd! He turns in the direction of his mother's voice, terrified. Mommy! Return to interior boy night, standing in the doorway, still holding the toy car. Gina sees that Boyd's bed is empty. She whips her head around and finds that he's standing at his closet door. Boyd? Come on, buddy. She puts out a hand and guides him back to the bed. She notices that his eyes are locked on the closet. What's going on? Boyd drops down on his bed, grabs his tablet, and frantically draws. In Country, written by Kat Davis and Scott Peterman. Exterior, Cambodian jungle, defensive position, simultaneous. Free chooses his knife to whittle away at his short timer stick. He keeps glancing up at the sleeping Julie curled up around her handcuffed arms. Well, you want to ask me something? Let's go ahead and ask. Oh, no. I, uh, you really from San Diego? City Heights, born and raised. No way. I'm right off of Man Manzan Manzanita Canyon. Julie pops her eyes open. Like shit. You go to Hoover? Climb the senior tower and everything. <laughs> wow. Small world. I, I wonder if we ever met. I think I'd remember you. Preach bless blushes, suddenly self-conscious. I I I I I I was I was pretty shy in high school. <laughs> Unlike now. 
Right. So uh, how did a girl from City Heights end up all the way out here? You know, I didn't have much of a plan when I graduated Berkeley. Turns out a BA in Southeast Asian folklore isn't the best foundation for a real career. Mm. And the IRC was desperate for native speakers. And she sighs, shifting to face preach. But honestly, I, I think I was just fed up complaining about the way the world works and decided to try and fix it instead. Did you? <laughs> fix it? <Huh>. No comment. <laughs> preach whittles at his stick, popping off a notch. What's that? Counting down the days till I'm not, till I'm out of here. She reaches for the stick. Preach pulls back instinctively, but ultimately lets her hold it. She counts the notches. Eleven. You get to go home in eleven days? God willing. He protectively takes the stick back. You must think I'm fucking stupid volunteering to get involved in this bullshit. No, I get it. I did too. Did what? Volunteer. What the hell did you do that for? I've been asking myself that for almost a year. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. At the time, it felt like the right thing to do. And now? No comment, I guess. Preach smiles ruefully as he runs his thumb over a short timer stick. Exterior Cambodian jungle machine gun nest simultaneous. At the edge of the patrol's perimeter, Haight and Ashbury crouch beside the machine gun, scanning the night. Ready? Fuck yeah, I've been ready. Haight produces their roll of acid tabs and rips one off. Ashbury extends his tongue and Haight places the tab on it. Ashbury does the same for Haight. They smile at each other. What are you going to do? Huh? When you get back, going to fuck some chicks, get a proper day job, settle down with a wife, two? Hate scoffs. 30 days. I re-enlisted. You what? Think about it. It'll be at six months almost to the day when I'm done. I re-up. We can serve out and go home. Together. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. I won't. Ashbury looks around, sees that no one is watching, and kisses Hate deep. Hate notices Tiny approaching the perimeter. He quickly pulls away from Ashbury. In the flickering light from the smoldering village, it's clear that Tiny's face has the same slack-jawed look that Hickscox did at the river. Tiny, what you doing, man? A white outline rises out of the darkness behind Tiny, barely visible. It wraps a slender white arm around his neck. Its skin is so pale, it's almost luminous in the darkness. Over Tiny's shoulder, its eyes glow in unearthly white. The fuck? The thing turns its glowing eyes on Hate and Ashbury. Whatever it did to Hickscox and Tiny doesn't work on them. Hate hoists the M60 and turns it on the creature. Fuck this. He fires the bulky machine gun from the hip. Bullets spray in every direction, tearing into the creature's flesh. A stray round grazes Tiny and sends him spinning to the ground. The creature clearly did not expect this. It shrieks, a wholly inhuman sound, and races off through the camp. All Peen Hammer by Joel David Setner and Daniel Flint. Exterior Rural Road Sunset. Todd Tibbs, Penn, Lanky, bops along to his transistor radio. A baseball card splutters in his bike tire. He sees a sign, antiques for sale. Rosie's house, garage, sunset. Todd browses the junk. Something rattles behind him. Under the shelf, tucked in a corner, is a rectangular wood box. Opens it. The ball peen hammer shines back. His reflection warps in the rounded peen as he reaches for it. Don't touch the peen with your bare hands. Rosie Rockwell, 50s, too frail, for her f too frail for her age, approaches. Her right hand is gone. In its place, a metal claw. The oils in your fingers will rust the steel. 
The hand is mahogany. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. Give me here, boy. With her claw, she crasps the hammer by the handle. You see this brand? That's the blacksmith's mark. This is handcrafted. I build airplanes with this tool. None other one like it in the world. How much do you want for it? You don't want this. Besides, it ain't for sale. Uh, how about a trade then? I got a Mickey Mantle rookie card. You really like this hammer, don't you? She fixates on the ball peen hammer. It likes you too. Huh? She replaces the hammer in its wood box. How about I just give it to you since you like it so much? He takes the wood box, but she hangs on. Something eerie reverberates between them. Thank you. No. Thank you, boy. Thank you. She releases the wood box and seems younger, a weight lifted. Uh, Merry Christmas. Rosie smiles so hard her face twists into a scowl. Merry Christmas! She chokes back an anguished cry of relief and guilt. Fade to black. December 24, 1969, Christmas Eve. Fade to. Exterior mansion night. A secluded 1920s Spanish colonial mansion evoking the golden age of Hollywood sits, sits tucked away high on a hill. Interior mansion entryway night. Dr. Jeffrey Tibbs, 40s, handsome, tall and chiseled, carries several gift bags into the tiled entryway. A sweeping staircase spirals, spirals to the upper floors. I'm home. Merry Christmas Eve. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas Eve. Eve. Penny Tibbs, five, curly hair, bounds around the corner and tackles his legs. Daddy, you're home. He picks her up as his son, Todd, and his wife, Mrs. Tibbs, 30s, in a dress and heels, approaches. Dad, Dad, look what I made. It's a manger for the baby Jesus. He inspects the manger soberly. Todd fidgets. I think it's just great. Beaming, Todd ducks back into the living room. Hello, dear. They kiss. As they separate, Marta, 20s, their maid, takes his bag, coat, and hat. Here's your cocktail. A, a double. double. Oops, sorry. <laughs> a double. Thank you, Marta. Daddy, Todd says you have to do sugary on Santa. No, old St. Nick is very healthy. Your daddy is the best doctor in the whole city. The Easter Bunny is one of his top clients, too. Wow! Mrs. Tibbs loosens his tie. Dinner's almost ready. I have dinner right here. He pretends he's eating Benny's belly as she laughs hysterically. Interior living room night. A fire casts long shadows onto the oak-beamed cathedral ceilings. Presents are piled under the Christmas tree. Dr. and Mrs. Tibbs look at on as Penny unwraps a doll and Todd unwraps a toy truck. An arched doorway leads to the kitchen where Marta cleans dishes. And one for Mommy. Which one do you want to open, darling? Open mine, Dad. Todd hands him a wrapped rectangular box. This is heavy. I hate to say it, but I think I won out on this deal. You go first. She opens. It's a diamond necklace. Oh, Jeffrey, it's beautiful. They kiss. The kids gag. Dr. Tibbs shakes his gift. What could it be? I wonder. He unwraps the wood box, revealing the ball-peen hammer. A ball-peen hammer? What's that? It's used for shaping metal. Didn't you say you needed a new hammer, dear? I did, because somebody cracked the handle on my other one. Todd looks away, embarrassed. Dr. Tibbs fixates on his reflection, mirrored in the peen. Cut to, quick flash, he sees his family dead, splattered in blood. Cut to, Dr. Tibbs breaks his connection to the hammer. What? Have you said anything, dear? Maybe too many daddy drinks? He shoots Penny a dark look and then drops the hammer back into the case, unnerved. Maybe it was the voices in my head telling me it's time for it was the night before Christmas. Yay! Oh. Penny snatches up the record album as... 
That's the wrong type of hammer, isn't it? It's perfect, son. He masses Todd's hair. Cut to. The record needle slides into its groove. Was the night before Christmas when all through the house. Intercut. Interior mansion various night. Marta sets Santa's milk and cookies and prepares to leave. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. All right, wish Marta good night and get ready for bed. Merry Christmas. Bye, Marta. Good night. Merry Christmas. You too. Night, night. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Penny and Todd scurry up the stairs as Dr. Tibbs finishes his cocktail and fixates on the ball peen hammer. The stockings were, were hung by the chimney with care. Mrs. Tibbs slides into his lap, but he barely notices. I'm heading to bed. Don't forget to give Marta her bonus. She tucks an envelope in his breast pocket. I don't drink too much, doctor. In hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. She sucks on his earlobe and retreats up the stairs. He grips the hammer shaft and touches the peen. His eyes turn black, fade out. The children were nestled all snug in their beds. Fade in, a metallic hammer strikes as horrific images flash. Ka-chunk, Marta dead in the entryway, clutching the bloody envelope. Ka-chunk, Mrs. Tibbs in her bed, strangled by her necklace. Ka-chunk, Todd, his face mangled, the toy truck beside him. Ka-chunk, Penny and her doll, tucked in her blood-soaked sheets. Ka-chunk. Well, visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. Dr. Tibbs cleans the bloody ball peen hammer, returns it into the wood box, and places it in a hutch under the floor. On his forehead is a red circular burn mark, fade to thump. Dr. Tibbs sits by the Christmas tree, covering his ears to drown out the incessant thumping from beneath the floor. And Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap. Fade to. He pours liquid Drano into Santa's milk and gulps it down. Eyes wide, he shakes violently, foaming at the mouth. The sound distorts into a low drone. And settled our brains for a long winter's nap. As the record needle slides through blood, fade to black. Flesh and Blood by Merlin Kamotzi. Interior cave, night. The fire is down to embers. Ellen has her eyes closed on one side. Max and Charles lie with their faces close together on the other side. They speak softly to each other. Violent Femmes? I love the Violent Femmes. Charles sings softly. Let me go on like a blister in the sun. Max joins in. Let me go on like a blister in the sun. They sing it again together. God, I just want to hear that song. Charles reaches out and touches the cross she wears and her neck. What's this? Max reaches up to touch it and brushes her hand against his. It was my mom's. Is she? Didn't make it. I neither. Pause. You're really pretty. Max blushes. Thank you. And he leans forward and softly kisses her on the lips. A shiver runs through her body. Across the room, Ellen is awake now, watching this. She's squinting, trying to see something in the low light. She pulls a mag light from a bag. She flips it on, pointing it at Max and Charles. The cave is flooded with light. As she does, she inhales sharply, and lifts up the gun she's holding. Max, get away from him! Max blinks, holding up her hand against the light in her eyes. What the fuck, Ellen? She and Charles separate. On his back, it's on his back! Max looks from Charles to Ellen to Charles, who holds up his hands. I I'm not. I swear to God, I'm not. Ellen fumbles in the bag, pulls out some vodka, and tosses it to Max. Max, please wash your mouth out. I saw you kiss him. Ellen is scared enough that Max does this, rinsing solidly with the alcohol and spitting. She turns to Ellen, speaking slowly and softly. 
Ellen, listen, you still have a very bad fever. I love you. I trust you. But you might not be seeing what you think you're seeing. Make him lift his shirt. Max turns to Charles. He hesitates. Just please. He nods and pulls his shirt up, facing Max and the light. His stomach is clear. Okay? No, it's on his back. On his back. Max gestures for him to turn around. He hesitates, and a chill shoots through Max. Oh, fuck. She grabs the bottle, swishing the vodka around in her mouth again and wiping the alcohol on her face and lips. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. I, I, I don't think I'm contagious. Fuck! I'm sorry. She takes the flashlight from Ellen and points it at Charles. She shimmies to keep the light on his front. Let me see it. I, ju I just really, I really liked you. Turn around. He relents and turns, lifts his shirt. There's a huge infected bite on his lower back. Black infection radiates out from it. Max breath catches her in, th in her throat and she steps back in horror. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Charles reaching for Max, desperate to make it better. Please, I, I, I don't think it's that bad. Get away from me. The horror in her voice cuts through any hope he has of fixing this. Get your things and go. Charles hesitates for a moment, then bends to put on his shoes and socks, which are now dry. He puts his sweater and then the garbage bags that he wears over his sweater. It takes fucking forever. He picks up his backpack from which he pulls out two cans of soup. He sets them by the fire, leaving them for the girls. His eyes are wet. I'm sorry. It just... I just wanted things to be normal, to be okay. In spite of her anger and fear and horror, this is something Max understands. She grits her teeth, wipes a spot from her nose, nods. Not right. Putting us at risk so you can feel normal. Charles nods. No, I'm sorry. He turns to go. He takes one step before the boom of a gunshot fills the small cave. The bullet smacks into the back of Charles' head and he falls over dead. Max turns to Ellen, eyes wide. She's too shocked to speak. Ellen lowers the smoking gun. He knew where we were. But he could have flipped at any minute. Come back here. They remember stuff, you know that. Tears well in Max's eyes as the truth of Ellen's words cut through the pain and confusion. Ellen lowers the gun. She's suddenly just a small girl with a terrible fever. Max goes to her and puts her arms around her, holding her and rocking her. In her sister's arms, Ellen grabs tight as Max comforts her. You saved me. Thank Exterior. you. Exterior woods, day. Simon sits in the tree he climbed the night before. He's stiff and dusted with snow. Below, infected mill about. A couple look straight up at him and jump towards him, growling as they do. However, they can't reach the lowest branches and the tree is too big around for them to shimmy up. He checks his shotgun again, still only eight shells left. He glances up. Above him on the branches he hasn't touched hang a number of large icicles. Simon snaps off one of the icicles. He whistles and one of the infected looks straight up at him. He lines up, drops it. The icicles drops harmlessly onto the snow next to the infected. Come on, you motherfuckers. Simon grabs another icicle. It's a monster, about two feet long. He lines up on the infected man below and lets loose. Think, thunk. The icicle slams into the gaping mouth of the infected and comes out through the back of its neck. The infected topples over, gurgling as blood pours from its body. Simon is completely shocked that this actually worked. He reaches for another icicle. Interior cave, day. Max and Ellen sit looking at Charles' body. Playhouse, Nashville Clipping, written by Casey Sinsick. Exterior house night. An assuming white house sits on a tree-lined suburban street. A dozen cars are parked on the driveway and curbs surrounding the house. Their wheels are perfectly aligned with the grass. If you could live your life another time, what would you change? 
The muffled sounds of a house party drift from open living room windows, the soft murmur of laughter and muted music. Interior bathroom continuous. Georgia Westbrook, early 30s, stands in front of her bathroom mirror, studying her features, taking in the way her cheeks curve, every pore like it's her first time seeing them. Over this, we hear her voiceover. Would you force Andre to use a condom? Wait a bit before having the kid? Ditch the MBA degree for something you actually care about? Would you try harder to find happiness? Or would you do everything the same again? Georgia runs a hand slowly through her hair. Where it passes through her locks, the hair color shifts from a drab brown to a slightly lighter, dirty blonde. It's almost imperceptible. I bet you wouldn't change a thing. You pussy. You absolute coward. Smiling at the new, at the new look, Georgia turns to leave. Her reflection is a half step behind. Interior living room continues. Georgia makes her rounds through the house party, flitting between the different guests. Suzanne, you okay? We still have champagne in the fridge, don't we? Want Andre to make a run? I'm fine, dear. You're too sweet. Georgia claps a pudgy, confident man, Simon, 40s, on the back. He turns away from his conversation. I hear Mr. Hanover took a liking to you the other day. And where'd you hear that? I have the place bugged. The entire office, like a CIA, CIA sting operation. Microphones in all the planners and lighting fixtures. Hmm. Tell your operatives. I can neither confirm nor deny that Mr. Hanover is eyeing me for the St. Louis account. Georgia is about to respond, but she catches Tyler, 14, out of the corner of her eye. Her son is tall for his age and still hasn't adjusted to his body. That's amazing, really. Uh, hey, Goblin emerging from the cave? Tyler shrinks. He desperately doesn't want to be here as he fills a glass with water. Ha. Huh. There are people here who want to meet you, Tyler. Simon Tafferty from my office. It's nice to meet you, Tyler. When Tyler doesn't immediately respond, Georgia jumps in. What do you say? Yeah, same. Nice to meet you, I guess. I don't know. He backpedals away. Tyler. She mouths, be good. Tyler's already gone. Yuki Clark, mid-30s, watches that play out and approaches Georgia. You blink and suddenly they're teenagers, hating themselves and the world. It'll pass, Georgia. He's delicate, for good reason. Is it ever weird calling him he? Georgia likes, Georgia likes that line of questioning about as much as she likes Yuki. No, it's not. Hey, people ask, not trying to bite your head off, just curious. Let yourself have fun here. It's your housewarming, let us warm you. That's what we're here for after all. Yuki's eyes are on Andre, mid thirties Georgia's husband across the room as she speaks. Interior, Georgia's bedroom night. The party's over and the silence is only broken by the hum of crickets outside the bedroom window. Georgia and Andre lie awake in their queen bed. She's turned away from him. He's staring up at the ceiling. The masks that they had on for the party are off. Sorry, I missed that. I always feel a little sad when a party ends. <laughs> it's kind of like the last scene of The Graduate. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you kept reality at bay for a few hours, but then it starts sneaking back in every time. Oh shit, this isn't forever. You know, there's an end to this, like a dam breaking, like you're coming down from a high. Hmm. And when was the last time we smoked? I don't know, hon. Well, we're overdue. We're way overdue. Hey, picture this. We send Tyler off to one of his little friend's houses for a night. Haley and Yuki's place, if you think him and that girl are still young enough for a sleepover, uh, turn off our phones and nobody around but you and me, baby. That sounds nice. She doesn't actually think that. Andre powers ahead anyway. You light up the candles, sit cross-legged on the floor, like in your college dorm, the night before I built your Ikea furniture. 
the mom, the hookerish, the bunderspitzer hurts. Okay, that gets a small laugh out of his wife. Carve a hole out of an apple, pack it full of kush, and make a night out of it. I don't know. Andre frowns. It's like he's talking to a wall. I'm trying, you know that? I'm making an effort. Fuck. She doesn't respond. Andre takes that as his invite to turn away from her, closing his eyes. Interior kitchen later. The clock on the microwave reads 3.20 a.m. The kitchen is still and bare, aside from dirty wine glasses across the counter. A dark figure gingerly enters the room. Interior, Georgia's bedroom continuous. The distant sound of shattering glass wakes Georgia from her sleep. Could that be, have been a dream? She listens for more noise and hears running water, a faucet. She slips out of her bed, taking pains not to wake her husband. Interior house continuous. Georgia creeps down the hallway. Her footsteps light against the wood's flat flooring. She stops in her tracks as she reaches the kitchen. There's a figure hunched over the sink, backlit by the faint glow of a streetlight, a woman with pitch black hair. The faucet is running and the woman is scrubbing frantically at something. something. There's a broken wine glass at her feet, blood on the woman's forearms and across the marble sink, a knife in her hand. Georgia takes a step back. The wood creaks beneath her feet. The woman turns at the sound. Wiry locks cover her face, but Georgia can tell who she's who she is from the moment they lock eyes. It's like she's looking in a mirror. It's her. Cut to. Interior, George's, George's bedroom morning. Flickering light plays off George's closed eyes. The sound of the faucet warps. For a second, it resembles a crackling bonfire. The shower's running, not a faucet. Sunlight, not fire, streams through the window. It was a dream. Georgia blinks herself awake and her eyes catch their alarm clock, 8.46 a.m. Shit, Andre, Andre! She stumbles out of bed, grabbing at her clothes. God damn it, piece of fucking shit. Interior, the holiday cottage, later. Cora throws up seaweed and stones like she's expelling a demon. Ian holds her head whilst Dr. Begg mixes powders in a glass. She offers the drink to Cora, who downs it, grimacing. What is it? I don't know. I'm just bringing down her temperature and hopefully stopping the vomiting. Those are stones. I am aware of that, Ian. Is this to do with the abortion? No, I don't believe so. I'm glad you told him about that. Well done. Eventually. Last one in the queue to know anything, as usual. Ian, there are circumstances. Fuck the circumstances. Fuck off, Ian. You don't know. No, I fucking don't. Right. This isn't for now. Cora needs rest. No. Cora speaks again. Oh. Ian picks a pebble out of the bucket. Why aren't you both freaking out about this? Cora? Oh, no, he won't understand. I will. Just tell me. It's up to you. I'm just saying it would be an opposite time whilst I'm here with sedatives. Tell me what? What? Do you have cancer? What is it? Ian. She teeters on the cliff edge of changing everything. I'm a Selkie. What? A Selkie. <laughs> oh, you have a mad sense of humour, my lovely. Ian, please. <laughs> You're off your head. She's off her head. She's not, Ian. It's your fault. Standing in the sea, crying like that. What are you on about? I left the sea that night and walked onto land for the very first time to be with you. You arse. Did you really never suspect? But there is no such thing as selkies. You're not a fucking selkie, okay? A noise in the hall. The door opens. 
Karen barges in, carrying bags of food and supplies. Sorry, but you're a what now? She's delusional. She is not. Sorry, can you not pretend this is fucking normal? This is not normal. Ian, this is real. Cora is a selkie. I didn't want to believe it myself at first, but it cannot be disputed. She is from the sea. Fuck off. If you need medical proof, I can provide it. This is why I never wanted to say. You just keep this shit to yourself? Cora, what choice did I have? I made one stupid decision 29 years ago and I'm still living with the fucking consequences. Everything Ian knows about the world crumbles like a sandcastle leading away. Right, so, what? Cora, I, I mean, all that high and mighty shit about me keeping secrets and what, well, you've been fucking lying to me from day one. Not just you. It's not like that. But it fucking well looks like it. Cora vomits stones and seaweed everywhere. What? Right oh. out, everyone. Now. I'm not going. You are. Dr. Begg forces out the men. Karen lingers, staring at her best pal she no longer knows. Why didn't you say? Karen. I'm sorry. The door slams. She's gone. Cora curls up, her worst nightmare happening all around her. Incoherent whispers slowly rise in volume until black lips. Exterior elementary school playground day. They appear to form words. We pan down just in time to see a black backpack held tightly by black hands. Finally, they release. Chad, white male, mid-twenties, snatches the bag out of mid-air. He throws it in the trunk of an old Mercedes and slams it shut. Oomph! The whispers stop. Dressed like a preppy college student, Chad attempts to hand a stout envelope to brown fingers. Instead, they motion towards a green satchel connected to a bicycle. Chad's girlfriend waits impatiently in the car. Baby, let's go. I'm hungry. The way she rubs her nose indicates a different kind of hunger. Almost done, baby. So, gee, read. You want to do a quick line? My friend over there is very friendly. Chad's head sways back and forth as he attempts to catch G. Reed's eyes. It's no use. We still can, can't see his face. Finally, audible words. I'm good. Just, just. I know. Just drop it in the bag. You want to count it first? No, no need. No, no, no need. Chad places the envelope in the satchel but leaves the flap open. G. Reed's hands nervously fasten the open bag over and over until he gets the placement just right. It has to be right. Like, no, for real. Okay, well look man, I'll see you in two weeks. Chad grabs G. Reed's forearm and forcefully gives him a dap. G. Reed quickly pulls out a, a pocket-sized bottle of sanitizer. He scrubs his hands as if they've been soiled. His eyes go back to the satchel. A soft mumble rises from his lips as he lifts the bag once more. It sounds like numbers. The mumbling grows louder. Current ratio can I equal 12.8? Where's the rest, Chad? The, the rest. What? The... the Rest. Look, man, I... Uh, the weight of 5,000. Do you read talks fast so you can barely understand? The weight of $5,000 and $100 bills is a little over 52 grams and another two ounces, but the diameter of the envelope says you paid in your usual sloppy fashion of ones, five, tenths, and twenty. <laughs> tens and twenties, even at the average ratio of four to one, five thousand dollars composed of four different denominations should give you around three point five ounces. Um, my bag weighs nine point two two ounces. Uh, the twelve a twelve ounce can of grape soda weighs uh twelve ounces. A bit closer to thirteen, given the weight of the can. The weight of the can. I drink grape soda every day. I know exactly how much it weighs. <laughs> how much it weighs, and according to my calculations, my calculations are never wrong. Do you pick up the This is not grape soda. The whiz kid drug runner offers his eyes this one time. G. Reed, black male, 23, unassuming, detached, decent looking, but nothing to write home about. Chad hesitates. He looks towards his girlfriend. A wide smile forms. Damn. See there? I told you. G. Reed. I love it when you do that. Man, you're good. Chad pulls another envelope from his pocket. He attempts to hand it to G. Reed, but once again is met with a finger motion towards the bike. 
I'm sorry, man. I wasn't trying to cheat you. I just had to show my girlfriend, you know, you're like the hood version of Albert Einstein or something. But seriously, it's all there. J. Reed hops on his bicycle. Look, man, with your smarts and my contacts, we could do big things. I know you work for Samson, but I'm just saying. Let, 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 later, Chad. Reed, G. Reed pedals away. Interior, tr the trap house, back room, night. A large dark figure pumps out a vigorous set of push-ups. A workout mask covers most of his face. Resembling a villain from a superhero movie, the figure stands and proceeds towards the front of the house. We follow his bulky shoulders barely fit through the narrow hallway. His eyes scan each other, each room as he walks by. Samson is his name, black and 34. He removes the mask, revealing an unkempt beard. The growl in his voice commands the crew's attention. Y'all niggas in here working or having a Girl Scout meeting? We working. Well, hurry up. We got drops to make. Yo, Black, hit me with that white. Black quickly brings Samson a small saucer covered with lines of cocaine and a tightly rolled dollar bill. Anybody see G. Reed? Samson forcefully snorts the white powder. Hell nah. I ain't seen that fool all morning. Now. Where's my walking calculator? G. Reed enters. His lips recite figures like ABCs. Right here, Samson. Now, now, according to my calculations, you know my calculations are never wrong. We have 10.7 pounds of that green. We have 10.3 pounds of that kush. We have 6% of cocaine. Samson takes another snort of the white powder. Oh, okay. Make, make, make that five and a half bricks of cocaine. Okay. What? Oh, but n n but nothing. Oh, we we have a meeting with the Texas boys to re-up next week. And they said you can have as much as you want whenever you want whenever you want it. That's what I'm talking about. Yo, G. Reed, you got that paper for me? G. Reed pulls two envelopes from his satchel. He repositions the flap over and over. I'm waiting. Finally, he hands the envelopes to Samson before applying more sanitizer. My God, G. Reed. That's why I keep you around. Samson smacks G. Reed on the head with the wad of money. Although painless, G. Reed reacts as if he's been assaulted, swiping at his head over and over as if it's on fire. Rambling spew from his mouth as the crew stares. Continuing to count his money, Samson heads for the couch. Sit. G. Reed brushes off the couch several times before taking a seat. Look, 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 Samson, could somebody else start picking up that payment from Chad? He, he's a prick, and you know I... <laughs> I hate touching with physical money. Physical money. What? D d nothing. What's my profit looking like for this quarter? His eyes twitch, his lips move. Finally, they produce sound. <laughs> oh, according to my calculations, Samson, you know my, they're never wrong. We're looking at 5K gross, 50K gross minus 10% for the connection of police force. 8% for the crew, 4% for lawyer fees, 2% for miscellaneous, that leaves you with $30,700.19. You sure? You need a calculator? I don't need a calculator, Samson. It's, I got it all up here. You know, my calculations, they're never... I know, I know. Your calculations is never wrong. It's what I'm talking about. We're looking good. Sam, Samson, I, I mean, it's okay. It's okay, but... But I did the figures on those guys in Texas, and their profit margins are credible compared to ours. Don't, don't you think the days of nickeling and diming are over? Nigga, you call 40 Gs in three months nickel and diming? You crazy. Look, Samson, I understand it's 40 Gs, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, you know? Uh, when I even hear the tip, really, I... But, but, but anyways, what we need to do is open up a legit business like the Italians do, the, the Italians do and run our paper through there. I, I can create a business module that mimics the structure of Google, Microsoft, or other Fortune 500 co companies if we could just- What the hell is you talking about, G. Reed? Why are you in here jotting down notes? I'm out there busting niggas in the head, taking territories. I, I, I understand, but, but I've been talking- I understand, but according to my calculations, you know my calculations are never wrong. You gotta, you gotta start thinking vertically. Besides, I've been talking to some people, and and I, I think. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You've been talking. You've been talking. Fool! I don't pay you to talk. I pay you to think. I run this. You hear me? Back in the day when them niggas was busting you in the head, taking your lunch money, I saved your punk ass. I know you remember what your crackhead mama used to call you. 
Samson's word triggers something in G. Reed. His eyes turn towards the table. We see a young G. Reed, 10, and G. Reed's mom as if they're in the room. The wide-eyed woman shouts vicious, viciously as she drinks from a brown paper bag. Anybody? Nina, will you go ahead and read it if you've got the script in front of you? Because the actress is not here. Sure. Thank you. Um, you just like your sorry ass daddy, except you can't even talk. Just retarded. Always around here twitching, talking riddles. Well, speak up. The child struggles for words. Uh, uh, mama, I, I... The moment over, Samson's and G. Reed's eyes meet, but only for a beat. Yeah, your calculations may never be wrong, but your assumptions are. See, that's how she gets you. She lures you in with a promise and she'll fire schemes. Who, who, who are you talking about? Samson lights a cigarette as his mind goes elsewhere. You see, see my grandma. Sunday in front of the old church, don't you? She used to preach about her. She ain't to be played with. G. Reed's mind traces back to the old woman with red stained eyes. I, I don't understand, Samson. I... She brings down empires. Shit. She had me for a minute. Them niggas, remember? I was just like you. Ambitious. Thought I knew it all. Yeah, I let her in. She promised the world. Pills to every desire. Just when you let your guard down, she takes it all. Samson, oh, who are you? Who, who? Samson's eyes grow dark. Translucent green veins rise from his face. It's consumed him. Envy, pride, wrath, sloth, lust, gluttony, and... A chrome-plated glock now rests at G. Reed's temple. Reed. And if you're not careful, it should be your downfall, too. And I'd hate to lose my best employee. Got that? Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, I, I got you, Samson. Good. Frenetic green veins dissolve as Samson lowers his gun. He hands the metal piece to G. Reed. Now, next time Chad gets out of line, you put this to his dome. He'll get it together. Ain't that right, G. Reed? Now, what are these holes you talking about? G. Reed swipes at his head incessantly as if it's been stained. Maybe it has. Exterior hair, night. Um, uh, o, 20s, black, parks his beater out front of hair. Uh, Jason, 20s, black, and Medi, 20s, black, slip out of the car. All are clad in black. Medi heads for the trunk while Jason eases to hair's door. O pops the trunk open, then slides out. So what's the plan, boss? Medi scours the trunk. Inside a cat burglar's paradise, there's rope and a chain, a grappling hook, fat flashlights, etc. Simple. Every shop on the street has a key lock on the roof because the county doesn't bother to update them. So we'll toss the grappling hook and climb to the roof. I was excited. But Harris key lock is insanely intricate. So I'm hoping we can crack it with, you know. Jo Jason opens the front door with his keys. Or I can just open the front door. He looks back at them, jingles the keys. Oh, and Medi look at him, then to each other, then back again. Yeah. That sure. works too. Medi grabs her backpack and three flashlights and shuts the trunk, leaves the rest of her gear inside. Interior hair, night. Jason hits the lights. Everyone gasps at the sheer weird beauty of the white walled walls and bronze bowl. Whoa. This is the place. Medi inspects the supplies at one of the stations, surveys the room, spots the red light out of the security camera. Just please be careful not to- uh... Crash! Jason stares at O as he labors over a fallen glass of barbicide. Break anything. I'm sorry. Jason lets out a frustrated sigh. Medi climbs on a station. 
What the hell are you doing? Betty takes out a small pair of scissors, reaches behind the camera with them. I almost got it. She feels around until click. There. The red light fades to black. It's dead. Now we've got free reign. Where's the safe? In the back. I'll go work on it while you two loop the, re the register. That sounds good. The back room is that way. Just follow the hallway. Betty nods and turns on her flashlight as she eases down the dark hallway. O, o pilfers every drawer he can find. Nothing safe. Jason hits the register. He's disappointed to find it empty. Slams it shut. Interior back room, night. The screen with four different brightly colored vignettes reminiscent of Andy Warhol replaces the old plantation. Betty scours the office, combs through Priscilla's desk. She opens a lower cabinet on the shelf and... Bingo! A large safe, safe in, hides inside. She puts the flashlight in her mouth, swings her backpack around, and opens it. Inside a safe cracking kit, she pulls a lock pick out, manipulates the locking mechanism. She feels around for a bit, then crack, the safe door pops open. Betty smirks until she sees what's inside. Interior hair, night. O packs a small duffel bag with the little cash she can find while Jason scrubs up the barbicide. Jason wipes his face. That should be enough for the shop. Fuck out of here with that, bro. I'm getting what's owed. I'm not trying to... Look, man, with all due respect, this ain't just about you no more. All right? I'm getting enough for everybody to keep eating. We got a whole street with signs up. Jason thinks, then glances through the storefront window out at a single shopper dressed in plantation-era garb across the street in the shadows. Okay, what the fuck? Jason! What? You and O need to see this. Jason and O look at each other, concerned. Interior back room night. Medi hunches over the desk. On it, three passports and lots of cash. Jason and O run inside. When Jason sees the pile of money, he stops in his tracks. O's jaw nearly drops off its hinges. Ah, I knew this place was loaded. Good shit, boss. Medi doesn't share O's excitement. What's wrong? This place is just the salon, right? Yeah, and... What would a salon need $100,000 in cash for? It's not adding up. Um, are those passports? Jason slides over, opens one to look at the picture inside. It's Priscilla, but her name's different here. Pezinu. Well, that explains the bull. They're from Greece. Uh -huh. But what about the cash? Who the fuck cares? Just grab as much as you can carry and let's get out of here. Oh makes a move toward the pile, a loud moan. They crane their heads toward the private door. Y'all hear that? He's coming from the door. A louder moan. Jason, is that normal? It's never been this loud before. The fuck's in there? I'm not exactly sure. I think it's their secret ingredient, but they don't let me go back there. That's boss code for the best shit's this way. Open it up. An even louder moan. O pushes Jason toward the door. Jason hesitates, glances back. Maddie's unsure, shrugs. Jason gulps and twiddles the keys in his hands. Moans grow more energetic, faster as Jason inches over. Moan, oh, moan. The knob quakes until Jason's steady hand steals it. He puts the key in the knob, slowly twists. Your mother raised you right. Jason takes one last look at O and Betty, both nod. You're one of the good ones. He turns back to the door, click. It opens and he steps into Interior private room, night. Shock blankets everyone's face. Jason claws at his hair as the moaning grows. Series of shots. What the hell is in here? Black A, black and white, feet stumble under hazy lights. What? B, faces of pleasure. Uh. C, black and white bodies writhe and grind on each other. Fuck! Priscilla, 30s, white, wearing an all-white doctor's coat, eases around the orgy with a metal table, sharp implements on top of it. She wears a medieval black plague doctor's mask. Jason recognized the orgy's participants. They're the missing black men from the posters. Oh, good. You brought friends, too. Priscilla lifts a servant's bell, and that same ding, ding, ding rings out, but it's no longer faint. Within a split second, uh, AI... Al leaps out of the orgy, drags Jason inside with a recognizable wrinkled hand. Two other black men snatch Medi and O. The three kick and scream to no avail. The door slams behind them, smash to black. Priscilla cackles over the dark. 
<laughs> Spin by Brandy Nicole Payne. Interior, Cupcakery Event Space Day. A sparkle and shine themed birthday party is in full swing. There are glittered linens, balloons with tassels, and a cart with a chalkboard sign that reads, Delilah's Cotton Candy Clouds. In a word, this party is cute. Joy, 33, a bubbly kid at heart, connects with each child as her cart spins, transforming the tiny sugar crystals to delicate wis wisps of fluff. She gives her friend Yvonne, 30, a cotton candy cone. Looks like you've made a fan, which is perfect because Des knows everyone. So getting in with her is key. I see. I got three potential bookings today. One already wrote a check for the closet. Yes. <laughs> when it clears, drinks are on me. The back door chimes open as Joy continues serving the guests. Moments later, a deep voice bellows. Gather round, girls. Joy looks. That voice sounds oddly familiar, but the man has his back to her as he lights the candles. Is that? It's time to cut the cake. She tenses up. All around her, everyone starts to sing. Happy birthday to you. But it morphs into a slow, creepy version as we get close on her body. Her pulse beats through her neck. Throat constricts. She tries to swallow, but her mouth is as dry as the cotton candy she holds. Her eyes fixate on his back, both desiring and dreading the moment he'll turn to show his face. Sweat beads on her forehead. Joy and the man lock eyes, and he stops singing. Yeah, that's him. The man, Dean, tries to shake it off and stay present, but his eyes keep drifting back. How is she going to play this? Joy seethes, in her eyes, white, hot rage. She marches toward him with a singular focus. Before he can say a word, she grabs the cake knife off the table and stabs Dean over and over, each gash driven with purpose. Everyone screams as blood pours out, everyone except Joy. On her face, satisfied relief. Balance has been restored. Joy. 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 Joy looks up to see Yvonne in front of her. Dean's still very much alive. She's confused. Honey, you're shaking. Joy makes her way to the interior, cupcakery, bathroom, continuous, and splashes water on her face to shake off her thoughts. When she looks up, she sees a slightly younger version of herself staring back, smiling slyly in a sundress and sandals. Standing behind her is a slightly younger Dean. He kisses her neck, caresses her waist, then hikes up her dress as she giggles. He enters her while she tries to keep quiet. They have an intense, passionate quickie until... Hold on. He pulls out, tries to move in into the other hole. She winces, reflexively moves away. What the hell? Just relax. You'll like it. He pulls her back. She laughs it off. That's not my thing. It is today. Really, I'm not into it. She tries to move. He grips her tighter. Dean! She struggles. Can't get free. Dean, I mean it. So do I. He finally breaks through. Dean, please! On her face, this is not happening. This is not happening. This is not happening. Yes, yes it is. She stops fighting, disassociates as their sexy rendezvous melds into rape. Interior, cupcakery, event space, continuous. Outside the bathroom door, Yvonne hears Joy throw up. 
the water runs, then Joy finally comes out, looking dazed. Hey, let's go up front and get you some water. Joy lets Yvonne lead her into interior, cupcakery, front of house, continuous, where she devolves into a full-blown panic attack. She grips a table, steady, tries to catch her breath, but it's shallow. She's spinning out. Yvonne hands her a glass of water. She drinks. As the water fills her body, she finally begins to calm down. Yvonne, on the other hand, is still on edge. What's wrong? But Joy's attention has moved on. She sees herself and Dean sitting together over coffee. Dean talks animatedly as Joy pretends to smile, her eyes as hollow as her laugh. Joy. Joy looks again but no one's there. Confused, she looks back toward the party. But her last name is Thomas. What? Oh, yeah. Des didn't take his name. She made a name for herself in real estate and before her marriage, and so she refused to give that up. Why? Why does that? Dean walks out to the front before she can answer. He immediately starts to butter her up. Joy, you look amazing. Almost didn't recognize you. Joy doesn't respond. Yvonne looks between the two. Uh, could you uh, give us a minute? Uh, oh. sure. Yvonne halts at the urgency in Joy's voice. Okay. Didn't know you had your own business now. Congrats. Look, I don't know. Dean over talks her, used to being in control. For my daughter's sake, I'm glad you're here. Cotton candy's her favorite. And today's all about her, right? I hope we can keep it that way. His question more of a threat. His wife, Desiree, 30s, walks in and interrupts to Joy. Hey, there's a line starting to form. Delilah's That's Nicole. That's Nicole. Do you want to back up, Nicole, and do that, darling? You're muted, babe. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Hey, there's a line starting to form. Delilah's asking for you. Her smile drops as she feels the tension in the room, notices the looks on all their faces. What's going on? Just catching up. Oh. And how do you two know each other? ECU of Joy, frozen, as she hears a loop of... Just relax. You'll like it. Dean, I mean it. Dean, please. Just relax. You'll like it. Dean, I mean it. Dean, please. Just relax. You'll like it. Dean, I mean it. Dean, please. I'm sorry, baby. I love you. She snaps out of it. She's my ex. She raped me. Oh, shit. On Dean, trying to swallow his ear so as not to explode. That wasn't. If it were, I, I would have gone to jail. You sure as hell tried to send me there. But now that Joy has said those words, she's free. Just because you weren't punished doesn't mean you're not guilty. I'll have someone get my car. She starts to walk out. Yvonne looks at Desiree, then at Dean, seeing him in a new light. She quickly follows. On Desiree, a deep sadness in her eyes. She looks weary, but not surprised. Honey, she's crazy. Desiree holds up her hand to stop him. She looks in his eyes, searching his face for a moment, not finding what she's hoping for. She resigns. She turns away and heads back into the party. On his face, a mix of anger, shame, regret. His knees start to buckle. He grips a table to steady, unsure of what's happening. His breathing becomes labored. Beads of sweat appear. His turn to panic. Alone in this room, Dean looks smaller and smaller as we cut to black.
The Exodusters pilot, written by Mark Nacarado. Exterior, Murray County Central Pike. Later, Brody and Cora on horseback. Calvin tries to keep up on foot with his stack of boxes. Assassin all the time, won't do his work, and I can't get him to put down those penny dreadfuls. Mm. When a boy is between the hay and the grass, they need a firm hand. Where's his daddy? His father passed about a year ago. My sympathies. She nods in appreciation. You got yourself a big fandango coming up. All of the groceries. Huh? Oh, yes. A man named Benjamin Singleton is coming to speak at our church on Sunday. Mm. He's the man organizing the exodus. You should come on out, hear what he has to say. Thanks for the invite, but I don't expect he'll be saying anything that'll interest me. You're staying put, huh? I am. I'm fine right where I'm at. Figure by this time next year, I'll have me enough chickens to corner the market in Columbia. They ain't gonna let you own no chicken empire. You're dreaming. Calvin, you hush your mouth. You know, we'd be there by now if you picked up the pace a little. I know for a fact that you can move faster than that. Calvin hides his head back behind the boxes, grumbles, starts to pick up his pace. Brody and Cora look. Kids these days, right? Well, then look at it as a business opportunity. You come on out to the church after service, I bet you sell out all your chickens and eggs in 10 minutes. Brody plays along. 10 minutes, huh? Maybe 15, 20 at the most. Sounds tempting. Let me think on it. Cora smiles pleasantly. After an awkward silence. You a church going man, Mr. Brody? The smile falls from Brody's face and a series of rainy, grainy images, all from Brody's point of view, flash in rapid succession. An explosion blows a torso in half. Flash, a bayonet is jammed into someone's chest. It twists. Flash, a blood-soaked Bible lit up by lightning. Flash, back to Brody. He sits uncomfortably, like he's trying to clear those images from his mind. M Mr. Brody, are you okay? Uh, uh yes, <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, uh, I, I learned a long time ago to not put so much faith in, uh, well, faith. <laughs> he stares ahead, lost in thought. Cora starts to say something, then stops. There's an awkward silence, then. So where's home, Mr. Brody? Did you grow up in Maury County? I live outside Ashwood, but I was raised in the Kansas Territory. Kansas? My mm -hmm. goodness. Then you must know all about it. What's it like out there? Is it true what they say about open farmland as far as the eye can see? Oh, I don't know. Kansas is the same as any other place, I suppose. It's been a while since I've been there. Brody gently snaps the reins on his horse. I'm prying, ain't I? Mama, my mama always said I was a nosy cuss, and she was right. A man deserves his privacy. That don't mean you can't tell me about you, if you want. We're from Louisiana, down around New Orleans. New Orleans. Big city girl, huh? Never been there. How is it? Dangerous. That's why we ended up here. Now that sounds like an interesting story. You ready to tell it? Cora's face falls, recalling something awful. You know what? I'm not. Hmm. Yeah, I hear you. In the awkward silence, Brody looks Cora in the eye. We can look, just look at the sunset if you like. She nods and smiles unconsciously. She pulls towards him a little tighter in the saddle. The two of them trot along as the sun gets low in the sky. Calvin stumbling behind the horse to keep up. Fade out.